I'm feeling a little bit nervous about being recorded. So good morning, everybody. Um, it's a little bit strange. I've got very used to Zoom now and seeing lots of faces, but there, there are nearly 150 people signed up for this morning. So we cannot see you all, but it's lovely to have you all here. I'm really hoping that you find this useful. We've had a lot of questions over the last few months um, all about reopening of halls. So hopefully this will really help with that. This is the first time using this new webinar format for Joanne and I, and actually for Community First Yorkshire. We are something of pioneers, Joanne and I. Um, so please do bear with us if there are any slight technical issues. Because there are so many people this morning, there are just a couple of general kind of housekeeping rules I wanted to go through. And we're just running things in a slightly different way. So everybody has joined the meeting muted, and that is just because of numbers. We couldn't cope with all the background noise. Um, there's also going to be no chat function either. So if you are used to Zoom, there's normally a little chat box that won't be there today. Again, that's just to do with numbers. Um, what we do have is a question box function. So once we get into the meat of the webinar, if you do have any questions about anything that Joanne and I are talking about, um, and we'll also have question sections, <coughs> excuse me. Um, so if something hasn't come up that you think is really important that you want to ask, you can type your question in there. I would ask if you could try and keep that just to um, questions and not chat in there. My colleague Hilary is supporting us this morning. She's also a development officer with Community First Yorkshire. You should be able to see her on the screen at the moment. And um, she's monitoring that. And obviously just to make it easier for her to find those questions, it'd be really useful if we could do that. Bridget as well is also supporting with the tech side of things. Thank you for waving, Bridget. Um, and she's been letting you all in. <clears throat> will be supporting with that side of things. Um, for those of you who signed up, you will know that we did ask people to pre-submit questions. Thank you ever so much to those of you who did. Really, really hopes Joanne and I. Um, just means that we can be better prepared for this morning. <laughs> I'm preaching to the choir on this, but I know that understanding the guidance and finding a way through it has been really tricky. Um, and Joanne and I really feel that as well. So it just means that we're as best prepared as possible and we're giving you the best guidance that we can. Um, because of that, priority is going to be given to those pre-submitted questions. We did have a lot in. Um, there was quite a bit of overlap with the questions, some on very similar topics, and we did also have some questions where there was different parts. So instead of going through this morning question by question, we have broken the session up. So I'm just going to bring up a slideshow now so I can just show you how the morning's going to work. Uh, can we see that okay? Just going to, sorry, my controls have gone a bit funny on my screen. There we go. So, all right, Joe, can I get a thumbs up? Poor yeah. Joe's, poor Joe's <laughs> the only face I can see at the moment. Looking good. <laughs> um, so, yeah. This is how this morning is going to work. We've just gone over the welcome. The way we've split it is there's going to be two parts. So the first part is more general rules and guidance, things that kind of blanket apply across your halls, looking at things like rule of six and um, capacity, risk assessments, test and trace. Um, we'll have a section for questions as well at the end of that where we'll bring Hillary back and she'll put some of the questions if any have come through in the box. We're then going to have a short five minute break, give me and Joe a chance to rest our voices and let everybody stretch their legs. And then in the second part of this morning, we're going to be looking at the specific uses for halls, activities and events. Again, we'll have another bit of questions. And at the end, um, there will be a feedback um, pop up box that comes up. It would be really, really useful if you could just take the time to complete that. There's not many questions, but because this is a new format for us, it'd be really useful to know how you actually find meeting like this, as well as the content of it. So please do complete that. Um, right, we'll make a start. So it's still me. Um, there's just a couple of key points I want to touch on before Joe kicks us off with risk assessments. Lucky Joe. Um, so this is very much our interpretation of the government and ACA guidance. Um, it's our best interpretation of this. We've spent quite a bit of time reading through it, talking to each other, talking to other people. But that is our interpretation. There is a little bit of common sense that does have to be applied to it as well. And at the end of the day, it is ultimately yours and your committee's decisions. I just want to make really, really clear that this morning we're focusing on step three of the um, of the um, coming out of lockdown plan, which is the period from the 17th of May. So next Monday. So anything we talk about, you can't go out and do tomorrow. You've got to wait until Monday. 
And at the moment, it's envisaged that that will take us up to the 20th of June. We don't know that yet. It may be extended. We have had some questions relating to events later in the summer and even some around Christmas, New Year. We've had questions about whether there'd be any further funding. We just don't know and we just cannot answer that. It's too far in advance. So this is specifically considering this five week period now from the 17th of May. And then the last three points I want to make <clears throat> are just things that hopefully they aren't going to come as any of a surprise. But ultimately, and this doesn't just apply to COVID, the decision to open your hall for any event or activity or booking and whether or not to accept a hire is the decision of the committee, regardless of what the guidance says. Um, so it is it's up to you whether or not you take a hire. Um, we did have a question about managing if you are not sure about reopening or if you're not sure about accepting a hire. There's no one way to do this, but if you do your risk assessment and your risk assessment is pointing to that an activity might not be safe to be held in your hall, you can use that to show somebody who's a potential hirer. And the other thing to bear in mind as well, <clears throat> from our conversations with halls over the last year, people have taken different approaches. It's also really important to bear in mind your charitable objectives and that you are there as a community facility and you're there to serve your community. Lots of conversations around mental health and well-being and how important it is for people to start using facilities like your halls. So also consider that when you're looking about reopening and whether or not to accept a hire. Um, there's also just one other point I'd like to clarify. So it's really important to be clear about what the role of the committee is and what the role of the event organiser or the hire is. So the committee's responsibility is very much to provide a COVID secure venue. The event organiser provides a COVID safe event. We get a lot of questions where there's obviously a little bit of misunderstanding around this. It is not the responsibility of hall committees to make events safe. You are looking at the venues. Um, I think that's me. Sorry, Joe and I both have lots of notes. So I'll go for this. You will keep seeing us look down. Joanne, am I okay, are you okay to kick off with the risk assessment? Yeah, sure. Thanks, Leah. Um, yeah, so um, so risk assessments. Um, before, before you're open, before you begin to think about uh, reopening, it's really important to carry out um, a COVID risk assessment for, for your building. Um, uh, the government guidance um, is really, really strong in advocating risk assessments and, and, and ACRE as well um, are really keen to, uh, um, to, to emphasise how, how important it is to carry out a risk assessment. Um, you should do this in consultation with any employees, self-employed cleaners, caretakers and volunteers that you have. Um, your risk assessment should sit alongside um, any other ris risk assessment that you had in place before COVID. So this is additional to your normal risk assessment, um, not, not in, instead of. Um, your risk assessment needs to identify any areas where um, the risk of COVID transmission is high. What action will be taken to mitigate those risks and who will take that action? Um, I've got a very simple pro forma up on screen um, for, for laying out your risk assessment. This doesn't have to be a complicated process. Um, it's not meant to be onerous with lots of paperwork and everything. It's just a fairly routine process that you need to go through just to make sure that your building is, is safe to reopen. You should share your completed risk assessment documents with all hall user groups and ask them to compile a risk assessment for their particular activity before they use your building. Um, so that's what what Leah was saying before I started that that it's that that you need to complete your risk assessment and make sure your building is COVID secure um, and you, the groups need to make sure that their event um, is, is COVID secure within your your building. So by sharing risk assessments and discussing how they work for each group you'll be able to ensure your building is COVID safe. Now, I'm sure um, most of you have seen on our website and on the, on the ACRE website, they've produced um, lots of information and, and documents. And amongst those documents are uh, risk assessment templates, 
um, for you to adapt to your circumstances. And they can be accessed, like I say, through the Community First Yorkshire website. And they're in Word, Word format, so, so they're very easy for you to, uh, to adapt um, to meet your, your needs. Um, that's a whistle stop tour through risk assessments. Like I say, there's more information on the website. So ne next on my, on my list is um, rule of six or six households. Uh, this rule applies to people meet, meeting outside at the moment. So we're in step two at the moment. Um, and um, it applies for people meeting indoors at step three. So that's as from Monday, 17th of, of May. It's important to note that um, the rule of six has changed this year. Um, and it's now no longer just the rule of six, it's um, rule of six or two households, as it says, as it says on the slides. So um, two, two, the rule of six can be from any six people from any number of households. They could be a group of six friends or from different households. Um, the government guidance does actually state that children of all ages count towards the limit of six. Um, that, that's a direct quote from the government guidance. So, um, so yeah, that, that's what they're saying at the moment. Um, the two households rule. So the two households rule says they can contain a number of people within those households. For instance, one household comprising of mum, dad and three children could meet with another household comprising of grandma, granddad and auntie. Clearly that's a group of eight people, but as they come from two households, that's okay. It's not a clear at the moment whether there must be social distancing between the individuals with, within this group of six. The announcement made on Monday evening stated that there would be a move to the public making more informed decisions on close contact and that more detail would be available short, shortly. Hopefully this will include detail on contact within those groups of six. On the one hand, they spoke about allowing hugging, but on the other hand, they were very much stressing that everyone should still exercise caution. All we can do at the moment is, is wait for further guidance on this and, and hopefully before, before Monday, we'll, we'll have some, some more information on, on, on contact between those, those people in, in that group of six. What we do know is that social distancing should be maintained between each group of six. So groups should be separated by at least two metres and there should be no interaction between groups. For example, if you're holding a quiz in your um, community building or village hall, each quiz table should have their own pens and paper and not swap the answers for scoring. Attendees should not swap tables so that they can chat to others on another different table. They should remain within the same group of six for the entire event. Um, we've been asked the question, if the rule of six means that an event can only take place with a maximum of six people, the answer is no. But if you have more than six people attending, interaction is only allowed within those groups of six or two households. As I've said, there must be six metres between each group of six. So you're perfectly entitled to have 18 people if, if that fits within your COVID capacity, but they must. The groups of six must be separated by the two meters meters distance. They, it can't be free mingling between all those 18 people. You would have at least three tables of six, six people um, to, to make sure that you're in line with the, with the guidance. That takes me nicely onto um, capacity within your halls. We've had lots of questions around, um, around how many um people that you can actually have have in your building when you when you finally open open the doors to the public and the overriding determinant of the capacity of your building should be ensuring that users of the building are able to observe strict adherence to social distancing of two meters or one meter plus risk mitigation where two meters isn't possible 
and I think we, we've all we've all heard about this the risk miti mitigation being being masks um, in general. Um, you'll need to consider floor space and you'll also need to consider possible pinch points. Um, in addition to the size of the rooms, you'll need to consider the rules specific to each activity. So um, umbrella or um, guidance bodies for such as yoga and table tennis and, and these kind of groups all have um, guidance on safe ways of running their particular activity. So, so it's, it's, it's looking at your um, building um, and floor space on the one hand, and it's also looking at the um, um, rules on the, on the activity that's taking, taking place. So when you're calculating the capacity of each room, ACRE is suggesting as a starting point, you may want to use one quarter of your capacity um, numbers that you were looking at pre-COVID. Um, or the size of the room in square meters and divide by four. So that's, that's ACRE's rule of thumb guidance for you. Now from step three, um, that's Monday the 17th of May, the government guidance states that the capacity for controlled organized events can be up to 50% uh, of a venue's usual capacity. Now these events must be organized by a business, a charity, or a public body, and the organiser must take reasonable measures to reduce the risk of transmission. So clearly, that's that's um, a bigger capacity than than um, Acres' general recommendation of of a quarter of capacity, but it's under under the strict rules that these are events organised by business, charity, or public body. Um, if when carrying out the risk assessment, you identify areas where social distancing may be difficult as people move around the building, you should set out one way systems and systems for queuing. Um, examples where this may be needed are for entry and exit to the building and moving to and from the toilets and kitchen. You can do this by using tape on the ground and using clear signage. For instance, you may need to use your usual entrance for people arriving, but use a fire door for people leaving. Now the use of the fire door as an entrance or exit is perfectly okay, but it shouldn't be propped open. Um, so it's important to keep that door closed, but, but you may use it as an, an entry or exit point. Um, one other thing you may want to consider um, is introducing staggered start times to ease congestion if, if you, if you've got multiple activities taking place in one building at the same time to um, avoid lots of people arriving at the same time. Um, if you introduce a staggered time, 15 minutes difference, that may be just enough to, to stop that, uh, that buildup of, of, of people outside. Um, so kind of in summary, there's not, there's not a one answer to what's the capacity of my room. You, you've got to think of, of of, of all those different um, issues that I've that I've outlined there, um, size of your room, activity taking place are, are the are the real real ones, and the, and then the the potential for for pinch points um, on arrival and exit um, as well. So that's the end of um, my uh, section. To start with so. Um, Hilary, I don't know if there were any questions that um, people would like me to answer before we move on to Leah. Uh, no, there were a couple, but I just answered them. Um, they were very easy ones to answer, so that's fine. You're, you're doing well. Everything's clear. Great. So that's Excellent. Great. Thanks, Hilary. Okay, in that case, uh, we'll move on to, on to Leah. Test and trace, I think, Leah. Yeah, I get all the best topics, test and trace and cleaning, lucky me. Um, I should probably just say, I was obviously a little bit nervous speaking to so many people this morning. Um, at the beginning, I didn't make clear, there will be resources from this webinar available after the session. They'll be on our website, they'll also get mailed out. 
So there'll be a copy, um, a fact sheet, which pulls together all the information Joanne and I are talking about, and it'll be broken down into the topics that we're using. And um, the webinar is also being recorded as well. So that'll be available if you really want to go back and watch, watch both of us talking about this again, or, you know, if you're struggling to sleep, whichever way you want to use it. And um, so test and trace. Um, let me move my slideshow on done questions there we go um so test and trace it's really important to assist with test and trace that the contact details for everyone who attends the hall are captured ideally this should be done using a qr code um, and to assist with this all halls are required to display a qr code poster for nhs test and trace the image on the screen i'm sure you're all familiar with these now they're in lots and lots of buildings this is what the poster would look like um, to generate one of these, if you haven't already done so, <coughs> download it and then also get further information, you should visit the NHS Test and Trace website. There'll be a link to that in the fact sheet when it goes out. If you haven't already downloaded and displayed a QR poster, even if you think it will get minimally used in your hall, you need to go and do that. The actual um, going and generating it, downloading it, it is not difficult at all to do. It's a really simple process. So you do need to do that before reopening. Um, there's also lots of information in the ACRE um, documents, and I will show you where they are on our website as well later on. It's under Appendix M, um, the test and trace information. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, if it's not possible for an attendee to use the QR code system, for example, they, they do not have a mobile phone, which I know a lot of attendees to village halls don't, um, then the event organiser, not the halls, the organiser should collect and keep safe in line with GDPR requirements, their name and contact details for 21 days. I should also highlight, it's not compulsory for people to provide this information. So that is just something to be aware of. Um, halls, as I said, do not need to collect or keep individual attendee details. Halls need to keep contact details for hirers or event organisers, um, which I know you'll all be doing anyway, because you're all very organised and organised and you've done your event bookings, etc. Uh, and the event organiser then keeps the individuals. If an attendee or event organiser contacts you to tell you that they or someone who's attended an event have COVID or COVID systems, First thing you do is you should be referring them to NHS Test and Trace to report. They, NHS Test and Trace, will then get back in touch with you um, if there's any further action required from the hall. It's really important to highlight with Test and Trace that you cannot share people's personal details. So you cannot be ringing around all your other hires and any other attendees. So it's saying, oh, Joe Bloggs came to a yoga class at the weekend and he's got COVID symptoms, self-isolate. That is not for you to do really really stay away from that just refer everything through to nhs test and trace right uh next one cleaning so i've put this um graphic up on the slide hopefully you'll all be aware of it it's being used a lot more now it's been used in the most recent briefings um, and you'll all be aware that there's a new little symbol added onto the bottom there fresh air um cleaning has been a really hot topic for halls over the last year it continues to be so and it is really important but I just really want to emphasise um, that the focus and the onus for making your spaces safe has really shifted to the importance of fresh air and good ventilation throughout your buildings. Um, when it comes to cleaning, uh, the kind of key point with it is to be really clear with any hirer what will and what will not be done and who will be doing that and when. And your risk assessments and your hire agreements should reflect this. Um, I've got another note in here, the importance to remember that creating a safe environment is all about um, fresh air and ventilation of spaces. Um, the recommendation is that the halls continue to undertake their general cleaning. How frequently that will need to take place will depend on what for and how often your hall is used and keep a log as well. Whoever is doing the cleaning should keep a log of when that cleaning is undertaken. Um, the onus, as before, still remains on hirers to clean before and after their activity event. Um, the focus is still on frequently touched contact points, so things like light switches and door handles, but this will also be activity specific. Um, if event organisers aren't sure what they should be doing to make the resort safe, they again should be contacting their governing body, who will provide further guidance on what may be required for their activity. Um, Hall should also, where possible, provide sort of just like a little box of cleaning products for high risk to use before and after activities. Um, there's also no need for specialised cleaning products. There's lots of evidence around that. 
There's a link on um, this screen here to a blog that Hillary, who's on today, wrote. This was um, as we were reopening the first time, all about cleaning, what to use, what to consider. So um, if you are reopening for the first time, you want a refresh of cleaning, I do recommend you go back and read that. Um, we've had a couple of specific questions. So one around soft furnishings. So I know that at the beginning, people were taking down curtains, getting rid of rugs, putting any soft chairs, et cetera, into storage. Um, if you do need to use them again, you can do, but you should consider the overall risk with this. So you could ask that curtains are not drawn. Um, soft chairs could be used, but you may want to limit the number of them that are used. So don't have them all just stacked upon the side, just put out the number that's needed. And um, perhaps just have an agreement that only one or two people actually put them out um, and ask people to sanitize their hands before and after using say soft furnishings and chairs. Um, there is absolutely no expectation on halls to go out and buy, buy hard chairs. Don't, please don't be doing that. Um, the other area in relation to cleaning, we get a lot of questions about is floors. Um, there's no specific guidance on relation to cleaning a whole floors. Again, it's dependent on the activity that's taking place. So for an example, um, a craft class who are sat at a table, it's not going to be necessary to clean the, the, whole, the whole floor before and after use. Um, but for a parent and toddler group, um, extra cleaning may be needed. I'd, I'd hope, actually, if kids were crawling around on the floors, the group might consider giving it a clean anyway. Um, but there is guidance specifically around those sorts of groups. If, and this is where we've um, had some issues, you have concerns over the type of floor you have, particularly this is with wood floors, um, and the frequency that it might need to be cleaned or using certain cleaning products on it, that can form part of your risk assessment to say that due to the nature of the building that the whole floors will only be cleaned at this time and only these products will be used. So you can put that in there as well. Um, I don't have a, no, I don't have a slide for the next one, but I do have two more topics. Um, the first one is around the COVID first aid boxes. So there are two acre appendices for this as well. Um, again, this comes from the beginning of the pandemic where we weren't completely sure how this was going to look and how things were going to work in reality. Um, whilst it's unlikely that this will happen, it is still recommended that halls have a COVID first aid box and a designated safe space for anyone who suddenly falls ill with COVID or suspected COVID. Um, Appendix H details what should be kept in the first aid box and Appendix L covers what action to take. Um, you do need to share the location of that box and the, um, uh, the location of the safe space with any event organisers. Um, we've also had a question in about vaccines as well. Um, so at the current time, there is no statutory requirement for anyone in any role, any job, volunteers, staff in any sector um, to have the vaccine as a requirement of their role. Um, there's been lots in the news about it, particularly in relation to compulsory vaccines for social care. There is, there is nothing there at the moment in relation to that. Um, halls and event organisers cannot either allow or prevent people from using the hall based on their vaccine status. So we've had a few questions where we're saying, um, can we have this? Most of the people will be vaccinated. You have to take that idea of most people being vaccinated or some users not being vaccinated out of your minds because you just cannot consider it in your calculations. Um, if a member of your staff or volunteer team has any concerns about vaccination, so whether or not to have it, any underlying health conditions they may have, the efficacy of the vaccine, they really should go to their GP directly. Lovely. And then the last one for me, <laughs> we'd call this policing and then thought, oh, that sounds a bit heavy, heavy handed. Um, so it's the responsibility of halls for compliance with COVID social distancing measures. And it's just to, to really, really reiterate, we've said this all the way through, um, halls do have a role in making people aware of their expectations of users' behaviour in relation to social distancing when they're in their venue. But you are not expected to police events or people's behaviour. The onus um, of responsibility for providing a COVID safe event lies with the event organiser anyway. And also anyone who's listened to the briefing on Monday, it's really, really starting to switch more to the idea of an individual's responsibility. <clears throat> and I know it's difficult, but there's an element of stepping up and trusting people to take that on board. We did have one about face masks as well. And um, I know that the rules with schools have just changed. 
but at the moment it is still required to wear face masks indoors for people aged 11 years or over. So someone does for 18s and under 18s, it's 11 years and over you're supposed to wear a face mask when it is not possible to maintain social distance and where there is no specific exemption or where it's related to an activity. So say if you're at a meeting you need to speak, it would be completely um, understandable that you would remove your face mask. Um, that's everything from my section. So Hilary, are there any questions to pick up there? Any cleaning questions? Uh, no, there's just, just one about the fire door. If, if a fire door can be left open without propping it open, can it be left open for fresh air? Oh, I don't know. We might have to check that one and come back. Because okay. obviously I know that fire doors normally should not be left open. I would, I would have thought, yeah, I would be guessing. So I think we should check, Joe. Yeah, I think I think we should check, but I do know that some block fire doors have um, automatic, an automatic way of, so if they're propped open, should a fire alarm go off, sure. um, they automatically shut. So I would imagine, but I don't know, I would imagine that, that that's okay, but but we'll come we'll come back to, we'll, we'll add that in the into the notes um, afterwards about about the, the fire door. Okay, um, great. Just two more here because I've just, just come in. Um, you mentioned the rule of six, then capacity of 25% of floor area. Is the rule of six only applying to tables? We have a Pilates class and the rule of six would make it unviable. Um, no, it doesn't apply, only apply to tables. Um, it, it applies, so as long as those um, in, individuals are, so they can arrive or they can group when they arrive in the building in a group in a group of, of six. And, and that means and we don't know what the social distancing between the individuals within that group of six would be. So as it stands at the moment today, a group of six can meet outside and that group of six can talk to each other and uh, kind of in a, it's really difficult to explain, in a, a or, or sit around a table and chat. But what they can't do is go to another group of six, which is, which is next to them, and um, then have a conversation with that group of six as well. So it, it's a very self-contained group of, group of six. Um, and we're establishing what the distance between those individuals within that within that group of six will be, and we're hoping that we'll get that information um, later on. A Pilates group, I it's a long time since I've been to Pilates, but I, I think that's a fairly stationary activity. Hilary, Leah, do you know that? Yeah. She's um, a, so we're gonna on a mat, aren't you? Yeah, well, I was going to say. Yeah. Yeah. So, so, so there isn't that moving around. So it doesn't seem to me like it's a group activity. So if you can get, um, it sounds like, to me like it's an individual activity. So that and there should be um, two metre distance between each person um, mm -hmm. carrying out the Pilates. Now, if you have a half time break for coffee then you can group together in, I don't know if that's a thing in Pilates, but if you did stop for coffee halfway through, um, you can then go into groups of six to chat, but you can't all, everybody in the room, if there's say 18, you can't all stand around in a circle, chat and have your coffee and, and interact in that way. So um, it, it's, I know I'm stumbling over my words and I know it's, it's really hard to explain. And, and I think, I think what, what, what we really need is, is that um, guidance on, on distancing between the, the rule of six. But I'm also thinking that um, a, a professional Pilates teacher will, will be governed by some governing body. Um, and, and I think this is, this is a really good case where um, I, I would go back to, um, or I would tell the hirer, the Pilates lead, lead person, to go back to the Pilates governing body and, uh, and, and find out what their recommendation is. 
this is not for the hall to decide. This is for the um, Pilates um, lead um, to to understand what the rules what the rules are in this situation. Sorry, long Sorry. convoluted and, and not very succinct. But I think with any of these things, it it, it it's it's complex. I was okay. just going to. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> sorry, I've got. <laughs> it's talking about COVID. It makes you cough. It's like when you say yawn and then you yawn. It's awful. And um, I was just going to add to what Joanne says. <clears throat> I do go to a gym. I don't go to the Pilates class, but I do see the room. It's a wooden floor. It's a square room, quite similar size to a lot of the halls that I've seen. What they've done for yoga, Pilates, all those sorts of. You go in a group, but actually you exercise as an individual. It's not like a couple's dance class or anything. They've actually gridded the floor. So you get a square um, and that's their 25, that's the 25% capacity. That's how they've done it. I've been in these classes before and if it's a really popular one, you know, you're hitting someone with your arm or your leg or something, that doesn't happen now because you have that extra space around you and they do have a limit. So I would imagine that that's where the Pilates instructor, when they're organizing the class should be thinking. And that's what Joe means about it being a, a stationary activity. Only if you're going for the coffee in the middle of Pilates. I wouldn't mind a break in the middle of my yoga class. <laughs> <laughs> Just bit. Oh, so, I don't know that. Pilates is even worse. <laughs> um, are there any more questions, Hilary? Yeah. Um, there's two questions about face masks. So do people need to wear face masks generally inside unless um, exempt or an exempt activity? And do need people need to wear face masks indoors or not because they are in groups of six within with two meters between each group. So um, this, the second part of that I'm gonna deal with first, that's the one that we're trying to get a little bit more clarification from on the government. So it's the amount of social distancing within your group of six. Joanne and I had a little bit of a chat back and forth about this yesterday. And we said we would feel very different going to a meeting with our colleagues um, who we don't see you all come from different households, sitting around a table inside six of us. Um, Love Joanne. I wouldn't be going out my way to hug her at the moment. If I was meeting up with my uh, mum and dad, my sisters, her husband, I would be hugging them. I probably wouldn't have my face mask on. Um, it's a very different thing. We've not got clarity on that yet in terms of what you need to do um, within that rule of six. In terms of wearing one inside, of course, if you've got an exemption, whether that's a medical condition, um, there's special landlords that lots of people wear now. I think they're green with flowers on um, that show that they're exempt from wearing face masks or it could be the activity. Um, we're gonna come on to serving refreshments in the second half of it, but if you think in say a cafe scenario, if you're inside, when you're outside the cafe, before you go in, you won't have your face mask on, you're outside. Put it on, mm -hmm. it on to walk to your table. You put it on to get up from your table to go to the toilet or whether that's to go place your order at counter. But when you're sat at your table in your group of six talking and eating, you wouldn't have your face mask on. So it does depend a little bit on the activity. Um, and it does also depend a little bit on personal preference. And hopefully when they give us a little bit more clarity on the requirements for social distancing within your group of six, that second part will be a little bit clearer. Did I cover both of them there, Hilary? Yep, that's great, thank you, there's, there's more now. Um, should people bring their own refreshments? Hmm. I think we're talking about activity sessions and um, I, I yeah. think I think yeah. that um, very much depends on the provision um, of, of the hall. I think if um, and, and the event organizer, um, if clearly taking your own flask of coffee, let's go back to coffee, <laughs> um, is going to be a lot easier for to to manage and to keep a, a covid safe environment if everybody just turns up with their own coffee and, and cake um but having said that if if the hall um feel that it's um that they can reopen the kitchen facilities or or make a kettle available um in a safe way and the event organizer feels that that they can manage the use of that kitchen so they they can um, do, do whatever cleanings needed um, like Leah said sanitize um, light switches and um, be before the event starts and after it finishes um, then then that's that that's okay as well uh, it, it's really it's really 
up to up to the hall and the um, event organizer um, within their risk assessment that they've carried out if, if it can be done done in a in a covid safe safe way i would i would say um, it, yes it's allowed if it can be done in a covid covid secure way is the short answer okay thank you right, there's lots of questions coming in now thick and fast <laughs> but i think they're quite specific is it, uh, I was just going to say, because the second half of the session we are moving on to, because refreshments is covered in the second half, specific yeah. activities, meetings, the whole uses. Um, yes, yeah. I think we're almost halfway through. So we're going to take a quick five minute break and give Hillary a chance to read through those questions as well. We'll come back, um, we'll cover what we've got on the different activities going on, and then we can see whether or not, because we might just pick up some of these questions anyway. Um, it's really weird when we don't get feedback from you all. I can't see you all nodding and waving at me and your thumbs up like you normally do. So that's what we'll do. We'll come back in five minutes. So um, stretch your legs, grab another cuppa, and we'll be back at 10 to. See you in five, everyone. Right. Hello. Hopefully everybody's going to have a lovely, nice stretch. Um, into the second half now. So as we just touched on briefly before the break, we are now getting into the specific uses of halls. So meetings, events and activities. Um, Joanne's going to start with the first half of this and she'll be looking specifically at meetings. So Joanne, off you go. Joanne, you're on mute. <laughs> had to do it why did it have to be me <laughs> as i was saying welcome back everybody um yeah i'm going to be looking at um meetings um in this half so start off with hall committee meetings um and from stage three face-to-face -face committee meetings in your uh, community building are permitted um the guidance for meetings states that attendees should still be two metres apart um, and if the meeting is held around a table, try to use a larger table maybe to allow this two metre distancing. Um, don't sit directly opposite anyone, so kind of staggered seating around the table. Don't share equipment, so don't share pens. Um, try to avoid having... Um, paper agendas um, and uh, back to what Leah was saying earlier, this, this emphasis on ensuring um, a well ventilated room. So, um, so yes, you can all um, start up those um, hall meetings again of your trustees and, uh, and, and, and uh, I'm sure life will be, will be a whole lot, lot easier. Um, but just, just remember, that we still have to be cautious. It's still that hands, face, space, um, and ventilation that we need to need to remember. Um, AGMs. We've all um, had lots of AGMs, either either postponed or or um, some people have um, had held them by Zoom. Um, from stage three, AGMs and other public meetings are are committed once again. Um, the, the recommendation is that attendees should wear, um, wear masks. It's suggested that seats are placed um, in forward facing rows, each group or individual separated from the next group or individual by at least two empty seats in the row or sitting in different rows. All, all those um, all those ways that you can uh, can make sure that there's the social distancing um, taking place. Um, it would be useful if you can have someone to uh, to help seat people to make sure that we we can keep those um, um, that social distancing going um, and and ensure rows are filled from the far end first. It's all those common common sense sense things. So. Um, so yeah, all these long awaited AGMs can all now take place. Um, but, but again, be really, really um, aware 
um, of, of all the um, procedures that you need to take to uh, um, to take precautions of, of the spread of spread of COVID. Um, so parish council meetings. Um, we've had a had a few questions about parish council meetings, and uh, they're now permitted under the government guidelines. And um, when I say now, I mean now. Uh, I think it was from the seventh of the seventh of May. Um, and there's also a legal obligation to allow the public to attend a meeting in person. Um, although councils are being strongly encouraged to allow to people to attend online until at least the 21st of June. So until at least step four. But but actually it is it is now um, uh, a legal obligation to allow uh, the public to attend in person if 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 somebody is really um, that's that's the only way they can feel they can they can take take part. I think we we all know um, quite a few people that have been quite reluctant to to embrace the Zoom technology. Um, well, um, no longer do they need to do that. So. Um, uh, it should also say, though, that uh, public attendance will be limited to the venue's COVID secure capacity limits. So, so if you you need to work out how many um, people you can can hold in your your hall, and and if if too many people turn up to to a public meeting, then then the event organizer is is perfectly entitled to 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 turn turn somebody somebody away if it would take um, take the numbers above above the safe limit for your hall. Um, the government is still encouraging um, allowing those people who feel um, nervous about attending meetings to um, to be able to access these meetings um, online. So it may be that you hold your your AGM and in, and people can come along or, or your par or the parish council meeting. Um, but if if you have Wi-Fi in your village hall, um, it would be really useful if you could um, allow people to attend online as well as um, as in person. Um, I, I think um, there's going to be a certain amount of uh, nervousness as as people are. Um, are allowed to get out and about again, and uh, and certainly it will take some people a bit longer than others to uh, to get the confidence to uh, to 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 go out there. So uh, that that's meetings. Um, yes, they're allowed again, but but um, be really really careful about um, about ensuring that they're COVID secure. Okay, Leah. You've done it the same as me. You're on mute. <laughs> I feel oh, well. <laughs> so much better now. I feel so much better. Just that's 100%, isn't it, now who have talked muted? Great. Um, so I'll just explain briefly this image first. Um, I appreciate the text is very small. It's just for um, demonstration purposes. This comes from um, a booklet. I suppose for want of a better word, that Acre put together with um, a couple of other organisations. Uh, we all learn in different ways, we absorb information in different ways. The government guidance, the ACA guidance, it's very text heavy. Uh, it can be quite hard combing through it. What this document does is it breaks down different scenarios in terms of layout and considerations. Personally, I find this quite hard to understand, but I know that some people really like it. So um, uh, where you look in here at the cafe thing, obviously it's showing you the one way system. But if you go up to a counter, it's showing you the spacing system for your tables and things like that. And this booklet does this with different scenarios. So it has a church holding there, which I believe set out for meetings. So that's quite useful. One particularly thinking of what Joe's just been talking about, uh, schools, office spaces, staffing spaces. Um, there will be a link to that on our website. And what I'm going to do a little bit more of in the second half of um, this webinar is I am going to pull up a couple of other resources so you can see where they are and you can see where they look like. But yeah, this one here. Um, in terms specifically of serving refreshments, obviously we touched on it a little bit before the break, 
But from the 17th of May, you can, anybody who's been sat in a rainy beer garden over the last couple of weeks will be pleased to hear, go inside for your refreshments. So things like your coffee mornings, which is like a drop-in for villagers, they can now resume again. Um, basically, it's the same rule as it is for cafes. So as Joe covered in the first half, uh, it's rule of six or two households per table uh, with two metres between each group and no intermixing between groups. Um, you want to be encouraging people to use test and trace and use the QR code. Um, the two key points for reopening in this step um, are that if you are serving alcohol at an event, it must be table service only. People cannot go up to a bar or a counter if they're going to be ordering alcohol. Um, and you can only consume the food or drink that you buy either seated at a table or you have to take it away from the venue. You can't be buying something and then mingling around. They want you to be in one spot or outside. So those are the key things to bear in mind when it comes to serving refreshments. Um, so the next one, activities. Um, so organized indoor sports activities are also now allowed inside a hall. Um, again, just want to reiterate the importance of um, fresh air. We do keep coming back to this in good ventilation. Um, and also it's the responsibility of the event organiser to ensure it's a COVID safe event. The organisers need to be checking with their governing body, as we touched on a little bit, I think with Pilates before the break. Um, and the event organisers risk assessment should reflect guidance from a governing body. At this point, I'm going to stop sharing this and I'm just going to show you a fantastic resource that ACRA have put together. So just bear with me a second. Um, so it's here. This is also a good opportunity to show you the COVID pages on our website. So this is our main website. Really hope you're all a little bit familiar with this by now. And um, if you look on the top here, there's a coronavirus tab. Click on that. Um, and it will go to reopening after lockdown on this side here. And then if you scroll down the page, look, you've got your own specific section, village halls and community buildings. If you drop this down here, this is where we put the most up-to-date information we have either from the government or from ACRE. And all the acre appendices are listed here. So I mentioned a couple earlier on. So the first aid box is down there as well. Um, and it's this one I want to show you. So it's the activities table. I know this is really hard to read on the screen. Please don't worry too much about reading it. It's more just so that you're aware that it's there and sort of roughly what it looks like. So what Acre have done is it's a long document. This is they've listed all the different types of activities and things that can go on in your halls. Um, and then they've also put at the top here, the different stages and the dates and then ticked for when they're allowed and if there's any special conditions. Um, so if you do have a, a wondering about a particular activity, please do go and check this resource out. It's really, really useful. Um, it's really important to note that activities can still only take place within your hall's capacity limit. So if when you've done your calculation of a quarter, um, um, and someone's saying they want to book for 30, they're allowed to book for 30, but your quarter of your whole capacity is 25, they can only book an event for 25. That has to, that has to kind of go first. Um, and let me have a look through. Yeah, so just reiterating again about the governing body. So for example, if it's table tennis that's going on, they really do need to be contacting Table Tennis England. You do need to be seeing um, the event organisers, risk assessments, and their risk assessments should reflect that contact. Um, some of the activities we've had questions about are things like uh, yoga, ballroom dancing and zumba. Um, and there are all sorts of indoor organised sports activities, um, but they're all going to be using the space in different ways. And this is why it's so important that they contact the governing bodies and also why it's an emphasis on organised sports as well. Um, the next activity, <coughs> um, I've got it under bridge and board games. So um, yes, these types of activities can resume from the 17th of May as well. Um, and when they're talking about these in the ACRE guidance, um, the emphasis on these and when they're talking about the nature of that, this activity and how it should go ahead, it's the fact that it's a seated activity and that people will be grouped. So it's going back to that rule of six again, people staying in their tables, in their groups, they're not intermingling. Um, if they're going to be using equipment, so things like cards or board game pieces, um, practical things to do would be to say to use sanitizer before and after, um, to use test and trace, do not come to the event if you're showing any symptoms. Um, 
And it's a way to allow people to resume these types of activities, but to try and keep um, any risk to a smaller group of people as possible. So that's why they've got to stay in the rule of six. We did get asked some questions around, I think it was bridge, but it was again, it was from July onwards. We just kind of answer that at the moment, but at the moment it's allowed. So I think you would be okay to go ahead. Um, and then the last one that we had on activities was choirs and bands, and I'm going to scroll down here. Um, arts, here we go. <laughs> um, so it's been one of the trickiest areas to navigate musicians performers during lockdown. We've had a lot of questions on it, and you can see here from the spreadsheet just how many um, different lines there are. The good news is it does get easier from step three. Um, so from step three, both professional and amateur performers, and under that I'm including musicians, singers, theatre, dance, bands and choirs, they can now rehearse indoors and also perform to 50% of the venue's capacity. That's going back to what Joanne was saying at the beginning. So that's really, really good news for that sector. And this does also include um, lessons for both children and adults as well, which is really, really good. Um, so yeah, it's a lot easier. There's no, um, there's no trying to figure out if someone's a professional or if they're an amateur, they both can, um, which is really good. Uh, I'm gonna stop this, Joe. Um, I don't think we have any more slides, so I might just leave it as just us two for now. And I think Joe just wants to say a little bit on um, life events, weddings, christenings, is that right? <laughs> We're getting too comfortable. <laughs> Yes, um, like life events. Um, so life events, including weddings, receptions, wakes, commemorative events, christenings, bar mitzvahs, all those, those kind of events um, will be able to take place from the 17th in stage step three um, inside um, with a maximum of 30 people. Um, or as Leah was just saying, um, if your venue capacity is a maximum of 20 people, then that's how many people you can have in, have in your building. But, but in theory, um, a maximum of 30, 30 people. Now there's more details um, on, on the mechanics of this in the government guidance on places of worship uh, and, wed and on weddings. So uh, I, if you are um, a, a venue that, that um, regularly um, has these kind of events, I suggest that you go and, and have a look at uh, the government guidance for places of worship and, and, and weddings. Um, and the guidance for cafes and restaurants um, should be followed in relation to catering for those events. Um, so uh, again, on the same, same lines as, as Leah was talking about for, for cafes, um so uh, so yeah go and go and have a look at the um guidance for cafes and restaurants um and and they'll they'll guide you in uh, in in what you can and can't do um when for the catering for these these life life events um events that can't take place at the moment um teenage and adult birthday parties um discos now, if my daughters heard me saying the word disco, they would say, oh, mom, it's not discos anymore. In my world, it was discos. At the moment, they can't take place. Um, uh, the, uh, the roadmap saves from step four, but we will have to wait and see whether, uh, whether step four actually uh, does allow teenage and adult birthday parties. Um, we'll see. We'll see. Um, no doubt uh, you will have heard uh, a couple of weeks ago the government announced um, uh, a dropping of the restrictions on numbers for funeral attendance. So it's no longer limited to 30 people, but, um, but what will determine how many people can attend um, a, a funeral is, is the COVID secure venue number again. So, uh, so if your venue um, it is your secure venue capacity is 30 well then actually you will have to restrict the numbers to to 30 um but but in theory um there is there is no limit on uh, on funeral on funeral attendance yeah. um 
children's parties we've had lots and lots of questions over over the the last few months about about children's parties um they are they are permitted inside um and 15 adults um can attend children's party if 15 adults really want to attend a children's party um uh, those adults um, must comply with social distancing rules um but uh, but yeah children's parties allowed inside with a maximum of 15 adults um in attendance um activities for the children can take place in groups of any number so they're not restricted to to the rule of six um the party must be supervised by such as a children's entertainer or another person with experience of supervising children. Um, so that, that's the caveat. Um, it, it's really, it's, it's essential that you, that they run um, in a professional way. I think that, that's what the, the government guidance is, is, really, is really getting at. Um, so yeah, um, children's entertainer or, or some other person experience in supervising children. Um, what, whatever um, activity they do, they must mustn't be loud music um, or any activity which would encourage shouting or singing. Um, so uh, so those kind of activities are, aren't permitted. Now, how on earth you prevent? Uh, a room full of um, young children who are high on sugar uh, from running around shouting and uh, I, I really don't know but those are the rules <laughs> um, and uh, the government guidance on out of school settings is is the place to go for for the for the rules on on if you're thinking of um, of taking on um children's parties i know it's a big earner for community buildings and village halls um so uh no doubt no doubt people are very keen to to start generating the income from from these these events but um but yeah the government guidance on out of school settings is 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 where you need to go now the final the final area that i wanted to cover was was larger events and uh we've we've kind of touched on it before but but we've said that organised performance events can take place um, from, from the 17th um, with 50% uh, capacity indoors, up to 1,000 people, um, and a 50% of capacity up to 4,000 people at, at outdoor events. So, so that, that's, that's a big step to get to, um, to allow these, these larger events to take place. The guidance for, for the, such these events are, is the Department for Culture, Media and Sport. Uh, and there's, there's a lot more information on, on these organised uh, performances um, and, how, and how those events can take place in, in a COVID safe way. So, so that's, that's the, the place that you need to look for more information. So uh, COVID community facilities which are COVID secure will be able to hold indoor gatherings subject to their own capacity limits. They should be organised by a business, charity, public body or similar organisation from step three, but they will need to ensure the safety of, public, of the public and prevent large gatherings or mass events from, from taking place. That, that's a, a quote from, from the ACRE um, guidance on, on running running events in, in your uh, community building or village hall. That's everything I've got on my, uh, uh, on my list and hopefully we've managed to cover, uh, cover all the pre-submitted questions in, in, in one way or another, even though we've not been able to do it um, in a direct Q&A type, type way, but, uh, but hopefully we've, we've managed to get the information in there. So, um, Hilary, have we got any questions that need um, uh, answering at the moment? Uh, yes, there is one going back to exercise. Sorry, I just said that I, I promised that I would um, clarify with you. Um, doing exercise, do you have to have space between um, of two metres apart or one metre with a mask? If you're doing an exercise, don't they, they don't need to wear a mask. So would one metre space be acceptable? 
Um, shall, shall I jump in? I was going to say it depends on the nature of the exercise. They need to go back to the governing body on what it is, I think, with this one. Um, right. it, it differs massively. Um, yeah, sorry. Yeah, yeah. I, I think you're right, though, Hilary. If you're doing exercise, that's an exempted activity for wearing a mask. So, uh, so I think we can answer that bit. But as to the distancing, you need to, uh, they'll need to go back to their, uh, the, the governing body on that one. Great. Okay. <laughs> And a few questions about children's party. Um, children's parties up to what age? You know, I before I came on here, I tried to have a look on that one and, and I couldn't find an age limit. Um, I kind of in my head assumed primary school age, but That's but right. that is not that's not based on anything other than than my in my supposition I don't I don't know do you have any idea Leah well I'm just I'm just thinking obviously because they specifically said teenagers so that's 13 up that is a obviously it's got an age attached to it hasn't it teenager the term um, and I'm just thinking primary schools have been treated differently there's been no requirement for mask wearing um, but if you're out and about if you're over 11 you're supposed to be wearing a mask and they've got away with masks in schools so so no, there's a, there's a there's a little bit in the middle there, isn't there? They're sort of 11, 12 year olds. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I don't think we know the answer to that one. I'm afraid. And uh, I haven't. We can ask. We can ask. We can find. We yeah. we can we can have an ask around and see if we can find out that. Okay. Um, and how many children can attend a birthday party if you have 15 adults present? That was another one I looked for, and and it's um, and there was nothing to say how many how many children. Um, I think you're looking at the COVID capacity of the building, um, so obviously you would have to take into consideration the 15 adults and and however many children. So in total, what's the capacity of you know of your hall? Divide it by four, um, whatever that comes up with. Um, I, I think that's that's the uh, that's the way to go when deciding on how many how many uh, children can attend. But again, because it's an activity that is uh, can only take place if it's run by um, a professional um, children's entertainer or, or somebody who, who kind of knows about supervising children, they they will know. What, what that answer is, but I'm fairly sure it, it's the capacity of the hall. Right, okay, thank you. Um, can parties for non-teenage children take place? I think that's We've the event, sort of answered it? that one, haven't we? Yeah. We'll, we'll try and get a bit of clarity on that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. That, it, that, that grey area in the middle, I think we, we're fairly sure it's primary school are fine, but it's, it's those, those kind of, yeah. Uh, in between 11 and 12 ones teenagers no teenage parties is, is is specifically no but but it's those 11 12 not quite sure about okay all right um you may have answered this but you know how i i switch off when i'm reading questions so um i've got one here for bands etc when 50 percent capacity is that 50 percent of new capacity of say 30 or 50 percent of old capacity of say 100 it'd be 50 percent of the what you're terming there is the old capacity the old your standard capacity, capacity. Yeah. Yeah. yeah your your kind of yeah yeah your capacity for fire the, the capacity that you were working to before covid um came along and threw us all into um confusion right okay um, and just one, someone still a bit unclear on face coverings at a seated activity such as a craft where people sit in groups of six, do they need to wear face coverings legally? Well, again, that's this uh, clarification on this um, rule of six that we were waiting for and we're hoping will will come before before Monday and, and obviously we'll we'll. We'll get the information out, out to people now. Certainly wearing face masks on arrival at the building until you sat down at the table. Um, I think at the moment you should wear a face mask um, unless you've got a reason not to. If you're sat sewing, we, we see people at meetings on the television and that, you know, kind of this. I know I was my husband was watching the snooker and everybody in the snooker hall, they were all wearing wearing face masks. So I, I would suggest that as it stands at the moment, face masks are 
are required um, unless somebody's going to eat and then you can take your face mask off to eat clearly um, but but um, but what happens from Monday we don't know okay Okay, there's, there's questions about live streaming, um, whether that's still allowed in parish councils, whether that is a hybrid thing legally. Um, I've said that we will check with the government guidance and send out with the facts afterwards because several people are asking about that. Um, and then someone's asking, will you be covering these topics again closer to implementation of step four? It'd be really helpful to clarify new rules from 21st of June. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, um, it's not that this hasn't been lovely it's been really helpful for us as well I think to really get our heads around this um my understanding is that if step four progresses as it's supposed to there would be no need for something like this because the level of lifting that's happened that there wouldn't be any but again it's a crystal ball we don't we don't know there's new things happening all the time they're talking about new variants um, I just saw something today where somebody was talking about tears in the Lancashire area because of the Indian variant. So there's there's all different sorts of things to consider. If there was a need for this, um, this came out of the questions we were getting from halls, the discussions we were seeing on the Facebook group, and it was clear that there was a need for it. I, I, I don't see why we wouldn't do something like this again. We did put it together in quite a tight time frame, um, but there shouldn't. It should be a lot easier from step four, I think is what I'm trying to say, guys. It's been really difficult, but that's the point where it should all get a lot easier. Yeah, I, I, I think I think if, um, if if we if we don't do something like this, there will obviously the acre uh, information, acre will be updating those uh, for sure um, in time for the 21st of June. So so you can always go there to access information. Um, if if there's a need, we'll put together an FAQ sheet and, and put that out there, put that on the website. Um, but uh, but yeah, if, if it's felt that there's a need for another session like this, well, we'll see what we can do. <laughs> really hope we don't have to. I really hope we don't have to, guys, but not in a, not in that I don't want to, just that I hope there's not a need for it, I think. Yeah. yeah. Is there anything else, Hilary? Uh, just one more thing. Where do we stand as a user if we don't think the hall has done what is necessary to make the venue compliant? I think you don't use it. <laughs> yeah, I, that's exactly yeah. what I was going to say, Hilary. I think you just uh, walk away and, and don't and don't use it. Um, also, also perhaps raise it with the hall as well from the hall's point of view. It has been a really difficult year. It's been a complete minefield trying to work out what to do, what not to do when and how um, and it may be that they've just overlooked something so you know do try and just have that conversation with them first but yeah as joe and Hank said I, th I, think, I think i think we're, we're all, we're all learning um th this is there's so much information out there that that inevitably um something's going to be missed somewhere uh, and 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 help helpful uh, comments are, are, is are always are always useful um, yeah, and I'm sure Halls would recommend, would uh, welcome um, helpful comments. Okay, uh, just one more. Any practical solutions when hirers don't comply with the guidance? Who is responsible for enforcement? Uh, well, you're not responsible for enforcement, as we said at the beginning. Um, you wouldn't take a booking from them again, I suppose. If there was... Um, some kind of media threat to the public if there was dangers of mass events it was an unsafe mm -hmm. event then um would contact local authority joanne yeah, yeah i mean for, first and foremost again like we've just said just speak to the um hirer and just just you know align those risk assessment forms again and make sure that um they're they're complying with your risk assessment and actually they're complying with the risk assessment that you agreed with them um, when they first um, agreed, you know, agreed to to hold the event. Um, so, uh, so yeah, and, and, and if it becomes difficult, well then, um, ultimate policing lies with the district council. Um, if, if you felt it was um, so severe that it needed escalating that's that's where that's where you would go but i, I suggest a, a a friendly conversation and, and re-look at those risk assessments is the is the first is the first step really because 
we want to make these um, events happen in a, in a safe way. Um, so that, that would be my advice. That's Any more all. questions? No, nope, that's all. No, okay. So I think we've, as we've reached the end of the questions, there's nothing that Joanne and I wanted to pick up on. So thank you very much, everybody, for signing in. Um, it, it's really wonderful to see so many of you using this, uh, and we do hope you found it useful. Um, as I did mention, a fact sheet covering everything we've discussed, and we'll also try and put in some of that inf um, those additional questions and that information as well, will be shared with you all. Um, there'll also be a link with the recording. They'll both be on our website, and they'll also be sent out. There'll also be a link to it in this week's e-newsletter as well, which comes out on Friday. Um, as I did show you in the second half, do please visit the coronavirus reopening section of the website, have a look at all the ACAD documents, all the appendices, the templates, etc. to help you. Um, if we do get any updates, we always post them on there as well. Um, and another really great source of information, I haven't plugged it yet, which is quite late in the meeting for me to plug this, is if you are not already a member, do please consider joining our closed Facebook group for halls. Um, I, I'm not blowing our own trumpets there. We just we just host this. The majority of the content on there is now from halls. It's a fantastic place for peer support. It's a great place to hear what other halls are doing. If you've got any questions or concerns, post them on there. Somebody else will have dealt with it in some other way. Um, it is a closed group. So it is just for trustees and committee members of village halls in Yorkshire. Um, if you do want to join, you can either search Facebook and look for community buildings and village halls networks or drop us an email and we can send you an invite. And that's it from us. You're all doing a fantastic job. Fingers crossed we're coming to the end. We know it's been really difficult um, and good luck with whatever levels of reopening you are doing next week. Um, take care and hopefully we will see some of you in person before not too long. Thank you. Bye.